First of all, I would like to thank you for this invitation. My name is Thais Dutra Vieira. I'm presenting Remplation's long-term effect, What If Left Alone, with the great support of Dr. Mathieu Tonin and Dr. Bertrand Sonoricoté. We know that meniscal injuries predispose patients to osteoarthritis of the knee. It has been reported that at 10 years follow-up, there is an up to four times increased risk of osteoarthritis of the knee after medial meniscectomy. There's still a lot of discussion regarding the existence of ramp lesions. Here we present a case of a professional soccer player with this MRI aspect. Then during arthroscopy, we can see a mild instability in the anterior view, which would be left alone by a big part of us. But then when we push the scope transnotch, we can see this big hematoma between the capsule and the medial meniscus. And with internal rotation of the tibia, the plateau is exposed. So the big question, do remplations exist? We found in this big series of more than 3,000 ACL reconstructions an incidence of almost 24% of remplations with different incidents in primary and revision ACL reconstruction. Five types of remplations have been described and four structures are mainly involved. The capsule, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, the meniscocapsular ligament and the meniscotibial ligament. So here we can see each type of remplation during arthroscopy. This is the type 1. It's a very peripheral tear. It's uh, considered a true remplation. This tear is very low. It's important to do a posterior exploration because this kind of tear can be easily missed on MRI. Here is the type 2. It's the less common type. Uh, it's a partial superior tear. In this case, the meniscotibial ligament is intact and there is maybe a potential for spontaneous healing. Here is the type 3 is the hidden lesion. The meniscus mobility is important if tested through the anterior portal. However, if you see through the transnotch view, the lesion is not visible. It's actually hidden under a superficial layer of scar tissue. This scar tissue can be easily debrided through the posterior middle portal. Here is the type 4, which is the second most common type. It is also unstable when tested through the anterior portal. However, it is really hard to see the lesion from the anterior portal. When we push the scope deep into the notch, it's easy to find this open tear with meniscal tissue on both edges. Finally, this is a type 5. It was first described by Professor N in Korea. It's the double tear. It's not as frequent as the other ones, but the surgeon should be aware of this type of lesion because it can be easily missed even through the posterior medial portal. The surgeon should always look for a second tear which is more anterior and it's typically found in chronic cases. Attention should be paid to the type 3 ramp lesion, the hidden lesion which is the lesion of the meniscal tibial ligament. In a series of 125 lesions of the medial meniscus, only 75 were found by anterior standard exploration. 29 lesions were found by the transnotch view, but still 21 hidden lesions were only found by the posterior medial portal probing. So now that we know that they exist, the question is what to do? This study presents the MRI results at one year follow-up from the ACL reconstruction. And 40% of the rent lesions that were not repaired were not healed. There are a lot of papers about the consequences of a rent lesion that was not treated during an ACL reconstruction. This study shows how the rent lesion can significantly raise the stress on the ACL graft. 
which can explain some failures in our ACR reconstructions. It's important to think about the anatomy so we can understand why some treatments tend to fail. In general, all inside devices are anchored in the capsule and they are not able to catch the meniscotibial ligament, especially in chronic cases when the ligament falls behind the tibia. That's the reason we use the suture lasso with a PDS suture through the posterior medial portal. The steps will be shown in a video. This is our classical approach to the ramp lesions with the hook through the posterior medial portal. We start testing the stability from the anterior portal. Then we place the scope between the PCL and the medial femoral condyle with a slight valgus so we can push the scope deep to the notch. Then we use the translamination with a needle to place the posterior medial portal. The foot is placed in internal rotation which opens the space and exposes the lesion. Then we use the left hook for the right knee and the right hook for the left knee. We first catch the meniscotibial ligament and the capsular part of the medial meniscus, and then the anterior part of the lesion. Then we tighten the knot. An important tip is to space your stitches with three stitches maximum. Our results of ramp lesions repair were published. In 2012, when we used the all inside devices, our rate of secondary meniscectomy was around 25%. Then, in 2018, using the hook, our rate of secondary meniscectomy fell to 15% and even less when he added a ALL reconstruction which seems to protect the suture. So the conclusions for ramp lesion, it must be considered as a posterior medial instability. The incidence increases from 30% in primary ACL reconstructions to 50% in revision cases. Spontaneous healing is not demonstrated. The combined repaired with the suture hook with the ALL reconstruction decreases the failure rate to 7% at a mean follow-up of 45 months. Our take-home message is that we consider posterior medial exploration to be mandatory in ACL reconstruction, and the high rate of lesions identified and the low rate of secondary meniscectomy following the repair has definitively changed our approach. Thank you very much. We invite you to check out our website and Instagram account. See you.